Good evening, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we just want to sit at your feet and learn from you tonight, Lord, as we continue our study through the book of Judges. And Lord, we look at the life of Gideon and the lessons you have for us. I just pray, keep our hearts open, and, uh, and may we just apply these things to our lives that so we can grow in our walk with you. And always, Lord, we want to worship you from our hearts. We love you. And may these songs we sing unto you bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 7 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And keep in mind that Judges chapter 6 through 10, verse 5, the focus is on the central region of Israel that's been affected by compromise, idolatry, of falling away from God. Now, these are various areas within Israel. It didn't all happen in the same area at the same time. And here in Judges 6 through 8, the focus is on the fifth judge, Gideon. And last time we saw God call Gideon when he was hiding out from the enemy, he was threshing grain in the wine press, and God said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And again, as I said last time, I think that's a hilarious statement because he's hiding. And I'm sure Gideon's looking around to see, is there anybody else here? Because he can't be speaking to me. I'm terrified. But it was the Lord speaking to Gideon. And Gideon made some excuses why he couldn't deliver Israel from the bondage at the hand of the Midianites, even though God said, you're a mighty man of valor, Gideon. And finally... You know, Gideon gave in to God, submitted to God's will. But think about this. Seven long years, the enemy is stealing their grain, their food. They harvest it. They, do all, they plant it. They do all the work. They harvest it. And they come down, the enemy, and they take it from them. So why it took them seven years, I don't know. But now Gideon is the man. And the first thing God wants Gideon to do is destroy the altar of Baal and the wooden, wooden image that the people of Manasseh were worshiping. And it wasn't just them, it was his own family. In fact, his father set this up. And God wanted Gideon to deal with this. And so now Gideon's ready. He gets 32,000 men to fight with him against the Midianites. And it seems like a pretty good number, but when you look at what the Midianites had, they had 135,000 men for war. We're told that in Judges 8.10. Israel's outnumbered four to one. And it's not great odds, but you know, you still think if you got the right battle plan, if you prepare enough, you might be able to defeat them. But as we move into Judges chapter 7 tonight, God's going to change the odds a little. And it's not going to be in favor of the children of Israel, at least not from a human perspective. And God is going to have his reasons for doing this, and we'll see that. And I think one of the big things is God is stretching the faith of Gideon and really the children of Israel. You know, faith is something that comes when you can trust the one you're placing your faith in. Now, when my kids were young, they loved to stand on the sofa and jump into my arms why did they do that? They're crazy, but besides that, they knew that if they jumped into my arms, I would catch them. They trusted me, okay? They would never do that now because they're bigger than me, and yeah, I'd go over. What's my point? My point is the more we know God, the more we can trust in him because it's hard to trust in someone you don't know. And so this is really important for us. In fact, Warren Worsby put it like this. He said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Too often what people think is faith is really only a warm, fuzzy feeling about faith or perhaps just faith in faith. I recall being in a board meeting of an international ministry when one of the board members said enthusiastically, we're simply going to have to step out in faith. Quietly, another board member asked, whose faith? The question made all of us search our hearts. J.G. Stipe said that faith is like a toothbrush. Everybody should have one and use it regularly, but it isn't safe to use somebody else's. <laughs> Amen to that, right? We can sing loudly about the faith of our fathers, but we can't exercise the faith of our fathers. We could follow men and women of faith and share in their exploits, 
but we can succeed in our own personal lives by depending on somebody else's faith. God tests our faith for at least two reasons. First, to show us whether our faith is real or counterfeit. And second, to strengthen our faith for the tasks he set before us. He said, I've noticed in my own life and ministry that God has often put us through the valley of testing before allowing us to reach the mountain peak of victory. Spurgeon was right when he said that the promises of God shine brightest in the furnace of affliction, and it is in claiming those promises that we gain the victory. Exactly. And I think that's what we're going to see here in our study this evening. The faith of not only Gideon, but the men who will go into battle with him against the Midianites. So let's pick up here in Judges chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us as we study his word and look at this fifth judge of Israel, Gideon. We're told, then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped besides the well of Herod. So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Now picture this in your mind. At the well of Herod, which is located at the foot of Mount Gilboa, were Gideon and his 32,000 men. And this battle is going to play out just south of the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, near the Jordan River. The Midianites are about four or five miles away at the hill of Morah. And they're preparing for war. Both these armies are. And the Lord tells Gideon, son, you need to hold on here a minute. You have too many men. I don't know. Do you ever read this and go... What are you talking about? They're outnumbered four to one. Why would you say that? And how would you respond? Lord, no, I, you got this wrong. They have too many men. Get rid of some of them, and I think we'll be okay. But that's from a human perspective. If God is going to do something, it's going to be for good no matter how bad it may look. And he's working, and we need to trust him and walk by faith. How does God deal with this issue of Israel having too many men for this battle? Simple. The Lord tells Gideon, ask his men, his men, if any of you are fearful, you need to go home. And that's what we see in Deuteronomy 20, verse 8. So the Lord's just re-instructing Gideon what he's already said before they even enter the promised land. It says that the officer shall speak further to the people and say, What man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. See, where there's fear, there's no faith. That's why the children of Israel, that first generation, didn't enter the promised land. Because they were fearful and they, didn't, they said, there's giants in the land. We're like nothing compared to them. They've got fortified cities, fortified walls. We're dead meat, and they didn't enter in. And God says, no, if any are fearful, they need to go home. And this is more than just being a little nervous or unsure. This is a paralyzing fear that caused them not to walk, and the Lord said, I don't want these guys in battle. Now, I don't know about you, but Gideon, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, when the Lord said this, those that are fearful could go home. Oh, well, you lose a couple hundred, because these are men, army guys. Fighters, soldiers, ready to, for battle. He loses 22,000. He's got 10,000 left. That's not a few hundred. Wow. I'm sure Gideon's thinking, man, what is going on here, right? Down to 10,000 men. And that puts the odds almost 14 to 1, 13.5 to 1. That's not good. I mean, you're talking about a war, a battle, and you have 10,000 men. Why did the Lord say this? Because he didn't want them to claim the victory. 
It's because of our might, our military strategy, the plans that we had. We won this battle. No, they're down to 10,000 men. It's going to get worse. But they're down to 10,000 now. And they're like, okay, God, you have to do this. In fact, Psalm 33, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. There it is. The Lord is going to be their help. He's going to be their shield in this battle. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. And that's how we have to approach things. That it's not because we're so great or so we have so many people here at this church, we could do so many great things. Look at what God is doing with a few people. Why? Because he's so great. It's all because of him. And so odds don't matter. Remember King Uzziah? King Uzziah was a good king in the southern kingdom of Judah. And in 2 Chronicles 26, 15, it says, He made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners, to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it was, God was helping him until when? He became strong. Look at me. Look at what I have done. There's the problem. Pride. And in 2 Chronicles 26, uh, verses 16 and 17, it says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Uzziah was struck with leprosy because he did not obey the Lord. The priest tried to warn him. They didn't, he didn't listen. He thought he was above the commands of God, and he wasn't. And so we have to be careful, especially after God gives us a great victory in our lives, because pride can develop, and the Lord will break that pride. Pride is a downfall for us. We have to walk by faith. We have to trust in him. And then he gets the glory. You know, that's one of the problems in Israel today is they are looking at their military strength. It's not about what the Lord has given them these victories. You know, when they became a nation and uh, the enemy surrounded them, attacked them, there's no way they should have won the battle. And they knew that God gave them the victory. Now, here we are in these battles they're facing today and they think it's their military might. No. We have to understand we're nothing apart from God. In fact, Paul the Apostle said, when I am weak, then I'm strong. When I know that I can't accomplish this in my own strength, then I'm strong because I'm going to have to trust in the Lord. John Wesley said, give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and that love nothing but God, and I will shake the gates of hell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, verse 4 here in Judges chapter 7. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. So God is still whittling these numbers down. 10,000 is still too many. And, you know, God doesn't tell Gideon who the ones are going to go home. He says, I'm just going to separate these two groups of people. So, you know, all right, well, the 300, they'll probably go home. I have 9,700. It's only 300. It's not too bad. Well, that's just not how it's going to work. Um, all those who got down on their knees and drank, they were the ones who got home, went, were sent home. Can you imagine? 9,700 got down on their knees and drank the water. 300 lapped the water out of their hands. Wow. 
How are they going to handle it? 300 men. Well, we don't know there's still only 300 left yet. We have to read on in verse 7 here. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the people, all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent them all away, to, all, sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So went from 32,000 to 10,000, and now 300. You know, the odds are 450 to 1. You know, if that's how Las Vegas was, no one would go there, right? These are horrible, horrible odds from a human perspective. Now, why the ones who were down on their knees, why were they sent home? Some say because they weren't paying attention. The others were cupping the water and looking around. They were paying attention. That could be. I think the main reason is the Lord only wanted 300 men. Some say, well, you know, the guys that had to get the water up and drink it were too heavy to get down, and so they were really good soldiers. They were too big to get down on their knees and drink. I don't know. Again, I think that God just wanted 300 men. I think it's as simple as that because God is going to get the glory. There is no way you could win this battle from a human perspective. But then you factor God in there in the battle. Yeah, absolutely. You see, here's the thing. We can be too big for God to use us, but we can never be too small. And that's really the key. If you think too highly of yourself, what will happen is you're not going to be looking toward the Lord. You know, well, I've got this. I can do this. I understand. I've got the talent. I've got the ability. That's a very dangerous place to be. If you feel that there is no way I could accomplish this, but I know what God has called me to do, that's the best place to be. Because, Lord, I'm going to have to trust in you. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, said, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it may de might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul understood God was going to use him in a powerful, powerful way. But just to put a damper on that pride getting into his life, God gave him a thorn in the flesh to buffet him. And now he understands all these things, infirmities, reproaches, and needs, persecutions, distresses. These are all needed in our lives to keep us humble and to trust on the Lord because I can't accomplish it. I'm going to have to rest in him. Strong in the Lord, but nothing apart from him. And how, you know, again, an army of 300 against 135,000 soldiers. Wow. The key is with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's always the key. Look at verse 9 here in Judges 7. And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Porah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened. To go down against the camp. Then he went down with Porah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Here is... An amazing thing. God's grace and mercy, he's extending to Gideon. He eliminated 31,700 soldiers from his army. He's down to 300. And the Lord says, I'm going to strengthen you, Gideon, here. 
If you're fearful at this point, you're a little unsure about this, I'm going to send you into the camp of the enemy. Bring Pura with you. Bring someone with you. And I want you to hear what the enemy is going to say about this battle. And it's out of this that Gideon is strengthened even more. You know, God calls us to do things that seem way out of reach for us, but he doesn't leave us there. The Lord guides us and encourages us so we can walk by faith. He stretches our faith. And even with the doubts and fears we can have, guys, God comforts us and leads us so we can press on, we can move forward. But you have to walk by faith. Just like a muscle, muscles are strengthened as we use them. And the faith muscle, in a sense, is strengthened as we exercise us, as we walk by faith. And God allows us to do things that we may have never done before. And it encourages us and strengthens us, increases our faith for the next adventure he has for us. Well, verse 12 here in Judges 7. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have just had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. You know, Israel was seen pretty much as nothing. They're being oppressed by the Midianites for seven years, okay? And this one Midianite has a dream, and he's telling his buddy about it. This loaf of barley, which is poor man's bread, insignificant, rolled into the camp of the Midianites and destroyed it. And as Gideon and Porah continue to listen, this is what the other man said. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. How in the world did this guy come up with this interpretation? Right? I mean, would you come up with that from that story? Not me. The hand of God not only gave one man a dream, but he also gave the other man the interpretation of that dream. And it strengthened the faith of Gideon. And when God is working, it draws people, his people, into what? What does Gideon do after this? He worships God. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing else. You worship him, thank him. And was he pumped up? Absolutely. He goes into the camp now of Israel. He says, arise for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Do you think his faith was strengthened? Absolutely was. Absolutely. Verse 16, then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers and said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do just as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon didn't come up with this battle plan all on his own, guys. In fact, it's not a very good one, if you really think about it. But he's dividing his army into three divisions, 100 men on each division, right? And gave them a trumpet and a pitcher with a torch in it, and they have to follow what Gideon's doing. Again, it doesn't even say they had a sword. It says the sword of Gideon, right? Of the Lord and of Gideon. But it doesn't even say they have swords. Their hands are full. A trumpet and a pitcher with a torch in it. So it's kind of hard to carry a sword like that unless they had it on their belt. But there's no indication at this point that they do. Who came up with this plan? God. And I believe he gave it to Gideon. And the reason why I say that is because in Judges 6.34, 
It says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. There it is. He's being guided, directed by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit. He's Spirit-led. And it's in a very natural way. It's not some bizarre way. Very natural. Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So the time frame of this battle was the middle watch from about 10 p.m. Uh, the first watch was from 6 to 10 p.m. Middle watch is 10 to 2, and the morning watch is 2 in the morning till 6 a.m. So most of the enemy is sleeping at this point. And the army of Gideon is all around them. They split up now into three divisions, 100 men in each division. And Gideon blew his ram's horn or trumpet, and all his men were to do the same. And they broke their pitchers, making this loud startling noise. And these torches probably consisted of smoldering rags on the end of a stick. So the torch was turned upside down and stuck down into the neck of the ceramic jar. And when the jars were broken, there's this rush of oxygen that comes in, and it probably set these torches ablaze. And they shout at the sword of the Lord and Gideon. It always has to be the Lord first. It wasn't Gideon first. And when this took place, as all this noise and light came out, it brought mass panic and confusion which in, within the camp of the enemy, and we'll see that. In fact, keep this in mind. In ancient times, a battalion of a thousand men marched behind one torch. So think about that. When the Midianites saw all these torches lit and heard all this noise, the mountains are ablaze with these torches. They panicked. They thought they were outnumbered. Again, one torch for a thousand men. Wow. Wow. And look at what takes place. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia towards Zira, as far as the border of Abel, Merilah, at Tabith. Now, Again, I don't think these 300 guys, men, had swords. Uh, it doesn't say anywhere in here that they do at this point. But here the enemy is so confused by the noise and the light. What are they doing? They're killing each other. They're in confusion. Thousands of Midianites died from friendly fire, you might say. And the rest ran for their lives. And from what we can tell, Gideon and his men defeated Iran... 120,000 men, 15,000 tried to escape according to Judges 8.10. What was the dream that the Midianite had and the interpretation? That this barley was going to roll into camp and destroy the Midianites, and that's exactly what happened. Exactly. And they're killing each other. And I truly believe the Lord gave them this victory. The Lord brought this confusion about around these men. And I don't think these 300 men of Gideon even drew the sword once as their hands were occupied. And here's something we can think about in our own lives. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 said, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I like how the Amplified Bible puts this. However, we possess this precious treasure, the divine light of the gospel, in frail human vessels of earth, that the grander and exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from men. It's interesting because the light of God shines brightly when we're broken, doesn't it? Because people are watching us. How are they going to handle this? And they see something that 
they don't understand. How could you be so at peace? How could you be so forgiving? How could you? It's God. It's only God. You know, if we're proud, it's just darkness that people will see. But if we're broken, the light of the gospel shines forth and it touches the lives of others. Well, look at verse 23 here in Judges chapter 7. We're told this. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Bara and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Bara and the Jordan. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Those are great names, aren't they? You know, I, I always thought, you know, my wife would kill me, but it'd be great to name, hey, Oreb, come here, right? You know, but no, it just, I also wanted to name our kids Medulla Oblongata because I thought that was a cool name, but yeah, you know, you don't want to do that. You get in trouble with your wife if you do that. What does Gideon do? He's calling for reinforcements to attack these other 15,000 men that are escaping. Some say, well, did he lack faith that he had to call others in? I don't think so. Did God start the work? Absolutely. But now I think God is going to work through the, not only these 300 men, but also these other men from the other tribes who are joining in this battle. And here's the thing. Yes, Gideon is listed in the uh, Hall of Faith section in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, it was in a perfect uh, faith, but he was a man of faith. But for Gideon, he started out really well. We're going to see that he finished the race of faith week. Now, let me touch on this. These two princes of the Midianites, Oreb, which means raven, Zeb, Zeb means wolf, they were captured and killed by the men of Ephraim. God blessed the men of Ephraim in this battle. And, you know, they do this often in the Bible. You know, I don't know if they carry them by their hair, but they bring the heads of these two guys. <laughs> hey, look what I got. You know, you, you, we think about that today. It's like a horror movie, right? But, yeah, they're definitely dead. They're not going to bother us anymore. But, you know, why did they bring the two heads of these two princes to Gideon? Because two heads are better than one. Is that right? Thank you. Okay, I can't use that for 15 years now. So, you know, I had to get it out of my system. And everyone goes, praise the Lord, right? All right, chapter 8, verse 1. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. So he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in, compar in comparison with you. Then their anger toward him abated when he said that. Think about this, guys. They're having this great victory, right? God has done this awesome work. There's 15,000 men left, and jealousy and pride almost hindered the work of God. Why didn't you call us, man? We would have come, right? Were they a strong tribe? Yeah. When compared to Manasseh, I mean, don't you know who we are? We're Ephraim, man. We're strong. And Gideon could have said to them, you know, look here, man. God called me to do this, not you. Just remember that. I don't care how strong you think you are. We got this battle with 300 men. But he doesn't do that, does he? That's what would be prideful. He tells the men of Ephraim, look, guys, think about this. What you did far outweighs anything I did. You killed these two kings. Wow. 
he put this contention, he threw actually water on a, something that was starting to be a raging fire. And that happens, you know. A great work of God is being done. Hey, why doesn't God use me, you know? Hey, rejoice in what God is doing. The men of Ephraim said, been praising God for the work that was done. Defeating this enemy that had oppressed them for seven years. But no, pride got in the way here. Uh, but Gideon put it to rest. They're no longer angry. And it's kind of like Proverbs 15, verses 1 through 2. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours, pours forth foolishness. Yeah, that's a great lesson for us. Are we looking for a war to bring about division? Or are we looking to bring peace? Well, verse 4 here in, in uh, Judges chapter 8. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Then he said to the men of Sukkoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I'm pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. And the leaders of Sukkoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered him. So he also spoke to the men of Penuel, saying, when I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. So these 300 men of Gideon are in pursuit of these 15,000 men of the enemy. They come to Sukkoth, Penuel. They ask for some food. They're tired and hungry. They did not ask these guys to join them in this battle. Just give them some food, man. And they refused to give them food. Why? I think the reason being is they didn't believe that Gideon and his men were going to defeat the enemy. Hey, we don't want to take any sides because if we side with you and you lose, they're going to come after us. So we'll just, hey, we're, we're just not going to give you anything. Wow. God, and Gideon says, I'm going to bring judgment upon you. Gideon knew that God had given into their hands the Midianites that they weren't going to win this battle. They are, they're done with. But these men of Sukkoth and Penuel didn't know. And it had to be discouraging. I mean, you know how it is when you're hungry. It's hard to get focused. It's hard to do things. And these guys have been fighting, and it's, they're hungry. But isn't it interesting for us as well how, you know, we're serving the Lord and the resistance sometimes we face from family and friends. You know, for me, the hardest part was, um, you know, I worked at a hospital, and so I worked on holidays, but I was always here at the church, Christmas and uh, all that. My, my family back in Chicago always got mad at me. Well, why can't you just come down? Because I'm a pastor. Now, it never bothered them when I was a nurse because I was a nurse back in Chicago, and I had to work on the holidays, Christmas, Easter, didn't matter. But now that I was a pastor, that bothered them. And it's family and friends that sometimes get in the way. You know, the first time I went to Russia, it was, you know, people were fearful. You know, the war's going to break out, everything's going to go, you're going to get stuck there, you're going to be put in the Russian army. Yeah, like they would like a guy who's five, five and a half in their army. Come on. Uh, but anyway, stop laughing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I had such a peace about it. But it, 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 we have to be careful. When God calls us to do something, don't let people discourage you in the work. I think that's the key. And, you know, Paul said, and I like this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't you feel at times 
am I accomplishing anything? I mean, is anyone listening? Is anyone learning? Is anyone paying attention? It, doesn't it get discouraging at times? Sure. But I always go back, and I hope you go here, to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Your work is not in vain. So be steadfast, immovable, continue doing it. Don't give up. And I think that's the key. You got to give forward because when you serve the Lord, your work is never in vain because God is going to do something. We may not see it right away. We may not even see it in our lifetime. But God is working. You know, I've told you before, my wife's grandfather was a missionary in China. Her mom, my wife's mom, was born in China. And, you know, she only had a little piece of paper. This was only the record of her birth, a piece of paper and from China. They had no computer documentation, nothing, a little piece of paper. And when the communists came in, they had to flee. And Julie's grandfather was devastated. All the work I put in here, all the work I have done was for nothing. And yet, what does it say here? It's not futile. It's, your work is not for nothing. Look at the church in China today and how it's growing. And the Chinese government tries to shut it down, but it's growing because it's a work of God. And so the labor he put in there, there's fruit from that labor, even though he didn't get to see it because he had to flee the country. Never forget, God is always working, guys. Well, verse 10 here in Judges 8. Now, Ziba and Zalmunna were at uh, Karkor, and their armies with them, about 15,000 men, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in tents on the east of no Noba and Jagba, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. When Ziba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them and took the two kings of Midian, Ziba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. You know, what I like about Gideon is he doesn't give up. God called him to do a work. It wasn't finished, so what did he do? He's forging on. He's continuing fighting these battles until the enemy was destroyed. And I think Gideon's faith is growing. It's getting stronger. He's trusting in the Lord. And it's all because he was willing to take that chance and walk by faith. In fact, Paul in, in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, says, not that I've already attained. That's Paul the apostle. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We need to press on, and that's always the key. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Verse 13. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Harris and caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him and wrote down for him the leaders, and he wrote down for him the leaders of Sukkoth and its elders, 77 men. Then he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, Here are Ziba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city and uh, thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. Then he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. So now this battle is over. Gideon finishes uh, his defeat against the Midianites, capturing Ziba and Zalmunna. And he goes back to those cities that refused to help him uh, with food uh, when they were hungry from battle. And it, Gideon said, I'm coming back. Judgment's coming. And the leaders of Sukkoth, he whipped or scourged them with thorns and briars. Many feel that it was so severe that these leaders died. The leaders of Penuel, he goes after them. Where are they hiding in a tower for safety? And Gideon brings down that tower, killing these men. They ran 
to a place of safety and it ended up being their destruction. We run to our strong tower, Jesus, and there's not destruction there. He's a strong tower. Verse 18. And he said to Ziba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabar? So they answered, as you are. So were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. So Ziba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. So these two guys, Ziba and Zalmunna, Midianite leaders, they're still there. And he's questioning them about the brothers that were killed, if they had anything to do with it. And I don't think this took place during a time of war that Gideon was in here. I think this was just a random act of violence on their part as they were oppressing the children of Israel and Gideon's brothers got in the way and they killed them. And so Gideon was going to do the same. You know, it's like Deuteronomy tells us in Deuteronomy 19 verses 11 through 13. But if anyone hates his neighbor, lies in wait for him, rises against him and strikes him mortally so that he dies, and he flees to one of these cities, then the elders of the city shall send and bring him from there and deliver him over to the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Your eye shall not pity him, but you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go, go well with you. So the, the cities of refuge were for those that didn't uh, premeditate a murder. It was an accident, you know. Um, but here, if someone premeditated a murder, there was no safety in the cities of refuge and they were to be released. And I think, you know, some say that it, it was just a relative of Gideon that was killed. When you look at it, it, it talks about his mother. I think it was his brothers that were killed, literally. And Gideon wants his son, who's a young man, we don't know how old he is, to kill these guys. But he's afraid and he refuses. And why did he want to do this? Because if you were killed as a leader, you were killed by a youth, that wouldn't be good. It's almost like when um, Jehiel killed Sisera. You don't want to be killed by a woman if you're a soldier. That looks bad on your record, you know. Um, even though you're dead, it still looks bad. Um, so, I don't know. These guys are kind of... I don't know if I would have said that to Gideon. You know, stand up, do it yourself. I'd be like, hey, you know, let me go. But Gideon gets up and kills these guys. What did, they what did Gideon take from these guys? Crescent ornaments. What is that about? Well, what's a symbol, symbol for Islam today? Oh, isn't it interesting? It's a crescent ornament. A crescent moon. This is not a new religion that was started by Muhammad. It goes all the way back in time. What did Muhammad do? He tweaked it. He made it a monotheistic religion instead of worshiping many gods. And it was trouble for Israel back then, and it's still trouble for them today. Well, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your sons, and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So the people wanted to make Gideon and his descendants after him king. Kind of a perpetual kingship coming from the lineage of Gideon. And, you know, you have to love what Gideon does here. He says, look, it, the Lord is the one who's supposed to rule over you, right? I mean, that's really good. We're going to see when we get to 1 Samuel that as Samuel got old and his sons weren't really good judges, they were pretty wicked, the people wanted a king. And Samuel was upset. You know, the Lord is your king. But they wanted a king and they got Samuel. 
Because I don't think David was David wasn't ready at that point. And here again, we see the people wanted a king, Gideon, over them and his descendants. You know, we're no different today. We want to look to a man to make a change. And in the end, it's really not the change that we were looking for because the best of men are men at best. That's the reality. The human nature. The Lord is the one who's to rule over our lives. And there's no one better. And here's where we have to be careful. After we've been used by God in a powerful way, people will try to lift you up to put you on a pedestal. And we can't allow that. We need to put that down, give glory to God, the one who truly deserves it. And again, I, I see Gideon saying the right words here. And if that's all we read, we think, well, he, Gideon's doing good. But his actions didn't reflect what he said. He told the people he didn't want to be their king, and yet look at how he's going to live. Look at verse 24. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, beside the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around the camel's neck. Gideon received over 50 pounds of gold besides these kingly robes, uh, and he amassed really a great fortune here. He served the Lord, but now he's living in a way he shouldn't have been living. He was living like a king. Didn't he just say that the Lord's the one to rule? Oh, yeah, but give me the money. Show me the money, right? Now, you may think, oh, Joe, you know, you're going too far on this. But let's read on in this next verse here, in verse 27. And I think you'll see what I mean about Gideon moving in the wrong direction. In Judges 8.27, we're told, Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Oprah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Now, again, there are some who feel Gideon didn't do anything wrong. He just made a linen ephod that the priest would wear. I don't think that's correct. What was this made of? Gold, right? Not linen. Verse 27, then Gideon made it, it this, all this gold, into an ephod, um, and he set it up in his city, Oprah. You don't set up a linen ephod, do you, for people to worship? And the key is that it became an idol. All Israel is going to play the harlot with it. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. How could the linen ephod do that? It can't. This is a golden idol that Gideon set up and the people worshipped. Now, were they worshipping the true and living God? I think so. I think they were worshipping the true and living God. I can't say for certain. But God doesn't want some golden image made for him to be worshipped by. He didn't like the golden calf that the children of Israel made. Why would you do something like this? Why would he do this? Well, some speculate that the tabernacle, again, is in Shiloh, which was located in Ephraim. Those guys were the troublemakers that were complaining before. And so Gideon, you know, maybe wanted some prestige, wanted to show the people of Ephraim, look, I have a gold ephod, and, you know, this was not only going to be a snare to him and his family, it's going to be a snare to the people of Manasseh. Exodus 20, 25. And if you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use a tool on it, you have profaned it. God, why doesn't God want all this stuff? Because he wants the focus to be upon him. Not some object, because God doesn't live in that object. There's a 
ancient statue of St. Peter and it portrayed as he gives blessing and preaches while holding the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It's a famous, famous statue. And it's located at St. Peter's Basilica within the Vatican. And some scholars have attributed to Arnolfo di Cambio from 1245 to 1302 AD. And on this bronze statue, St. Peter has his right toes worn down by centuries of pilgrims who touched the foot or kissed the foot of St. Peter. This is what we're told about this. There's almost always a crowd of worshipers about this statue. As soon as the devotions, which are continually going on at some, at some, on, at some one of the many altars, are over, the devotees rise, approach the statue, and kisses the great toe of the foot of the apostle, after which he softly rubs his forehead against the instep. Several toes have been worn away by this contact of human lips and have been replaced. And if you will look at the foot carefully, you will see that the present toe is considerably worn. Among the memories of St. Peter's that will at least linger longest with me is one which recalls a crowd of peasants gathered about the statue with rapt faces and un upturned eyes as though they were gazing upon God in heaven. They thronged about it, almost crushing one another in their efforts to kiss the bronze foot. Many of them, in order to secure the, uh, this privilege, had walked from 12 to 15 miles knowing not where they would find shelter for the night. Standing here in the splendid church, they presented a strange and picturesque appearance Dressed as many of them were in old sheep and goatskin mantles, leather leggings and sandals of hide. In this temple, grander than the wildest dream of heaven's glories, before this bronze statue that to them is the veritable apostle, they evidently forgot the hardship of their rude existence. Protestants can never appreciate the feeling with which this statue awakens in the heart of the true Roman Catholic. Gregory II wrote Emperor Leo the Isurian, Christ is my witness that when I enter the temple of the Prince of the Apostles and contemplate his image, I'm filled with such emotion that tears run down my cheeks like rain from heaven. Do you think God approves of that? Absolutely not. And just because you have tears of emotion, you know, since 1985, I've had tears of emotion every year when the bears are playing, right? <laughs> but they're worshiping the statue as God. And what is it? It's a statue, guys. That's all it is. God was against it with the children of Israel before they entered the Promised Land. He's against it here with Gideon, and he's still against it today. We don't worship this kind of stuff. We worship the living God. Well, verse 28. The, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their heads no more, and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his offspring, for he had many wives. So 40 years they had rest, um, but spiritually speaking, he's leading the people of God away from the Lord. Not only had this gold ephod, this gold idol, but he had a harem. He had many wives. And what does the Bible say? Well, you go back to the Garden of Eden, one man, one woman. But how many of them disobeyed that? And then they paid the penalty. All these children that were born to Gideon, 70 in total, 70 sons, wow. And we're going to see one, the one son he had by a concubine in Shechem is going to kill 69 of them. Did he need more wives or concubines? No. God doesn't sanction polygamy because it brings conflict and crisis to families. He's established what a family is. Well, verse 31, And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech, now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash's father in Oprah of the Abizorites. So 
Abimelech, do you know what his name means? Gideon calls him Abimelech, and it means my father, a king. Well, isn't that interesting? What did Gideon say? You know, no, you should have the Lord rule over you. But he calls one of his sons, my father, a king. Wow. His words said one thing, his actions were contrary to that. How sad. You know, we have to be careful, watchful after the victory as before the battle. Because there's a lot of landmines scattered out there. And the enemy loves to get us tripped up by them. Well, let's finish up. Look at verse 33. And so it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So Gideon dies. They go back into idolatry, right? And Gideon and his children, remember, they wanted to make Gideon and his descendants kings, right? But now they're not showing them favor. They're not being very nice to them. Isn't that interesting how fickle people can be? Oh, how sad. You know, maybe they were only following Gideon for all they got from him. Now that he's gone, they don't want anything to do with his descendants. We have to be careful. Again, in those victories, the devil loves to trip us up. But we have to fight the good fight. We have to finish the race. We have to keep the faith. We have to stand strong because the battles never end until we go home to be with the Lord. You know, we think as we get older, things will be a little easier. I think they're a lot harder. Why? Because we're growing in the Lord. We're maturing in the Lord and the battles are more intense. The enemy doesn't want us to um, see people come to Christ. And so he'll trip us up. He can't take our salvation away, but he can destroy our witness. You know, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Gideon. It ends kind of on a tragic note. And we're going to see the circumstances of that as we read on next time. Lord, help us to stand strong in you, to fight the good fight, to finish the race, to keep the faith. Lord, never give up, but keep forging ahead. We love you so much. I pray for everyone here, those listening on the radio, the internet. Lord, any that are struggling, that are hurting, that, uh, Lord, that just need your touch of comfort and peace, please, Lord, touch their lives, encourage them, and help us to walk as you called us to walk. In Jesus' name, amen.